Hello and welcome to another episode of Back to Britpop. It's me, Chris. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Glenn Johansson of Echo Belly. Glenn talks about the remastering and reissues of People Are Expensive and Gravity Pools and the process behind that. Also goes back a little bit further and talks about his musical influences and how Echo Belly got together and the early days of the band. Just quickly before we hit the interview, those of you who've been with the podcast since season one would have noticed that I'm no longer using music from bands in the actual episodes themselves. Um, It was just a little bit of a legal minefield so I took the decision to take out the music from the previous episodes and now no longer use any in current or future episodes. I hope that's okay, I know it takes a little bit away from the podcast but it's it's more important to hear from the guests themselves. Uh, So thanks for your understanding on that one. I'll be back at the end of the interview to talk about how you can support the podcast. But in the meantime, here's Glenn. Welcome to the podcast, Glenn Johansson. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And you? Yeah, I'm really well. Yeah, good. Thank you. Great to speak. Great to speak to you about uh, uh, music and and Echo Belly and past and present and all the sort of things you've been getting up to. How's how's things been going for you in this the last year has it been hectic as usual um no not really um <laughs> we uh, are releasing uh, re-releasing a couple of albums people are expensive and gravity pools uh, they never really had a proper release before so we decided to re-release them and put them on vinyl and cd so we, we kind of been busy doing that to be honest with you um also lately about writing i'm just started recording at home now for, for the next album so yeah, but it wasn't that busy in the beginning, but it got busier as the year went on, really. That whole kind of remastering and re-releasing project that uh, mm-hmm. you've been doing with those two albums, how did that yeah. how did it come about? Did it something you and you and Sonny kind of collectively decided you had to do? Uh, yes. Um when we left uh, Sony Music back uh, late 90s, I think, um we kind of uh, financed started our own label and financed these two albums ourselves so um and they're quite uh, precious to us if you like um uh, i think they're really good albums uh, they haven't really been heard that much to be honest with you so we thought now it's the time to actually give it a, a proper release you know and mm. also to put them on vinyl as well which was the main idea and has that process been quite cathartic in a way as well? Well, to be honest with you, sometimes it's kind of painful going through old stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, we had to locate the masters, first of all. Um, and I, I found the tapes. We had them on uh, all the masters on DAT, uh, D-A-T, digital audio tape, that people used uh, a lot back in the day. Uh, not so much anymore, or not at all, in fact. Uh, so it was a bit nerve-wracking playing these because they haven't been played for like 15 years or something. So yeah. I managed to borrow a Dutch player from our old producer and started going through these tapes. And, of course, one of the tapes got chewed up, you know. <laughs> so, oh, fuck, you know, we, 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 you know, we kind of lost that song, you know. We can't really release it like this. So, uh, so I contacted uh, our old producer, Ben Hillier, and he had a look around his archive and he found a safety copy of it. So thank God for that. So we finally yeah. managed to to get them all all done, you know. So we because we had to digitize them, you know, fr- from the data tapes. So so it's finally done and uh, it's a bit of a relief to be honest with you. It's yeah. really scary to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's that people reconnecting with that music as well, and also the the, the, yeah. vi- the vinyl aspect is so such a popular medium nowadays as well, oh. isn't it? The tax. Oh, it is. It has gone. It has skyrocketed. Yeah. I mean, I just spoke to uh, the, the company we're going through at the moment, and uh, they got serious delays. All the pressing plants up to like a month or two, you know, it's, it's, uh, everyone seems to be doing vinyl at the moment. So uh, they got their work out for them, definitely. Yeah. Going bit, back a bit then, Glenn, if you don't mind, I was, I was really interested and keen to... You have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Of course, yeah, course, course. Dive, dive back. Um, <laughs> when you kind of got into music, really, and, and the artists that you were into and any kind of guitar heroes that you had? Uh, well... When I when I was uh, a young boy, um, I was really into kind of kind of heavy rock, really. Um, I think Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, that kind of thing. Um, so I kind of started w- w- with those kind of bands in mind, you know, when mm. I started learning playing guitar. 
uh, that obviously have to change over the years. Um, but uh, I kind of got back to Zeppelin in a, in a big way, to be honest with you. Um, I really like Jimmy Page. Uh, I like, like his playing, you know, on record. Um, so, yeah, those kind of people. Who else? Uh, yeah, I guess Gilmore. Gil, uh, yeah, Gilmore, I think, uh, as well, when I grew up. But then later on, I got into the sort of people like Johnny Moore, the Smiths, and so on. Uh, uh, I thought he was a really, really good player, kind of unusual. So even people like The Edge from U2, you know, who is very, never really talked about, but he's, he's a very inventive guy, you know. So yeah. uh, those kind of people. And you kind of, kind of, I guess, developed your own kind of sound, I guess, because the guitar, and I, is that like the Les Paul tone, do you think, that, that gives you kind of the, the, the echo belly sound, do you think? Or, or is there just yeah. a type of playing that you have adopted? Probably. Um, I started out, when we started out, uh, I had my old uh, Telecaster. still have it. Um, uh, so I used that on the first EP we did. And when we recorded our second single, Insomniac, um, we had some money at the time and uh, I bought myself uh, Les Paul. And uh, that's been a prominent part of, of the early Echo Valley stuff, especially the first three albums. Yeah. It's yeah. a really, you've got a very distinct uh, guitar playing sound, I think. And it kind of, a lot of the bands from the 90s, and I guess were um, looking back, I guess, at the era, mm. but also um, developing kind of their own kind of style uh, and, and like a uniqueness to it. And I think you can really pick out Ikebele's guitar style, I think, from, from any other band in that era. Oh, all right, okay. Uh, yeah, it's nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, I don't, because I, during the kind of the height of Britpop, uh, the guitars were very kind of um, fairly, fairly clean, so to speak. Yeah. But I always had a little bit of that kind of heavy rock in me, so to speak. So, yeah, so yeah. M- maybe that, I don't know, you know, the Marshall and the Les Paul, you know, hey, it's classic, isn't it? It's a good combo. It's not bad at all. Not bad at all. <laughs> so, in terms of like uh, the formative years of Echo Bailey, how yeah. how did you guys kind of meet and decide that you wanted to write songs together? Well, I met Sonia first of all, uh, early nineties, and uh, she always wanted to sing. She said, "So, so we just started to kind of see if we could write some songs together," which which we did. And I remember recording some demos uh, on a like an old cassette. Porter, Porter Studio or Tascam or something like that, or Fostex or whatever. Um, that, so that was the really early, early ones we did. Uh, the song Bellyache from our first EP was probably one of the first things we ever wrote together, I think. And uh, later we, we later we got hold of Andy, our drummer, and then eventually Alex Keeser, the bass player. So we, there's a four-piece uh, when we started. Um, we haven't released an album at that time. We released an EP or two EPs, I think. And uh, one evening we were all in Camden to see some band or something. And I, uh, we were all a bit drunk, I think, because I, uh, <laughs> I tripped up on the, on the pavement and on, on a twig or something like that. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I fractured my elbow. Uh, I went back in the pub and so I'd be all right, you know. And then a few hours later, mm, maybe I should go to the hospital. So it was fractured. So, so we just had a tour coming up. And, and Debbie Smith, she had uh, been to quite a few of our gigs and we kind of got chatting. So we asked her to, to uh, fill in uh, or help me out on, on the tour. I was in a kind of lost the cost, but I could still play a little bit. So, so Debbie joined as well, you know, and then recorded our first album, Ego. So, yeah. And so those sort of early sessions then when you were developing... Mm. Like mm. the, the sound as a five piece then mm. what what were they like were you kind of zooming in on kind of what was going to be your like uh sound maybe not consciously to to be honest with you it just kind of happens you know yeah uh, i'm sure you're aware of that yourself uh when you rehearse you know you, you kind of get to know each other's styles and it kind of all kind of gel you know we were quite lucky it all seemed to gel really well when we rehearse new songs i used to just bring in uh, the songs and just like a basic structure and we all kind of you know worked it out and uh, which then became the final product yeah um yeah so 
it wasn't really a conscious decision of looking for a sound as such, you know, it was mm. just more influenced by the people we, we liked at the time, I think, you know, well, yeah, I think yeah. we we're all big Pixies fans, for instance. And, uh, you know, we had that, we had, we had one, it's not quite true. We had one thing that we kind of always trying to do early on was to have that whole quiet verses and really loud choruses, you know, uh, that kind of difference in light and shade, so to speak. So, that that emphasis was on that to have you know really kind of uh, sparse courses maybe just bass drums you know and then mm. the course oh verse sorry and the courses comes in and you just bang you know did you all have like an input in terms of like uh contributing to the songs and stuff did everyone have like ways of chipping in or was it kind of down to sort of two two or three key people I I I brought the song in. So me and Sonia were the sole songwriters as such but um everyone had uh, an input in terms of arrangement and what to play and so on yeah so it was a collective effort as well yeah lyrically what kind of stands out about echo belly as well is kind of you you kind of marry that positive messages within some of the songs but you also have like that kind of politically and um and kind of introspective kind of looks at society as well themes throughout the lyrics so you kind of get a bit of the best of both worlds in terms of the content do you know what i mean yeah i, th- I think that's was one of our strongest points what was early on was the lyrics i think uh i think sonia s- sang about subjects that no one else really dealt with you know yeah uh it's quite it was some quite dark things you know we, we had a quite a lot of things happened to us kind of in the past and they kind of reflected the lyrics as well. Uh, she, she was very much, she sang a lot of lyrics for us about, you know, kind of equality for women, for instance. And, yeah. Uh, and so on. So so she always had uh, a real theme in her lyrics on you. She never wrote any kind of nonsense. It was always had like an underlying meaning, you know. Yeah. And were you kind of reflecting some of that, songwriting on what was happening at the time because obviously the 90s was an explosion of all sorts of you know, Britpop being one of the things but also the political things and laddism and and all sorts of other kind of toxic uh kind of and misogynistic kind of stuff going on were you yeah affected by that yes um definitely lyric wise Sonia was very affected by that I think that's why we didn't really sit that well with the whole Britpop thing at the time we didn't think so at the time anyway because of uh, the content of the lyrics. Yeah. And because uh, it was a very, as, as you said, a very laddish kind of culture, you know, you had all this uh, horrible loaded magazine and all that sh- shit, you know, yeah. so football and birds, you know. Uh, so it, it didn't really sit that well with us, to be honest with you. But, but you know, so I, I guess I guess we got a lot of flack for that as well. Yeah, but I think you were quite seen as as a, as a band that was was standing your ground in terms of what you wanted to represent which i think is quite yeah a refreshing and encouraging thing to see yeah thank you yeah thank you. Um, say so. so when when did you start getting sort of record label kind of interest because i know you were you were you were kind of signed to well signed pandemonium first, sorry pandemonium that, that was our first ep uh we released one ep with a, it was a very small label based in labra grove in london uh, they were basically mainly a dance label, I think. Um, they had a sub label called Kicking, I think, at the time. Um, so we, they did one EP with us, and we signed with a label called Rhythm King. Uh, Rhythm King were in a similar position to Creation, meaning they were funded by Sony Music. Yeah. So basically, Sony paid for everything, you know. And, uh, and the idea was for us to do the first uh, two albums on uh, Rhythm King and then go over to Sony for the third album. And uh, they had uh, they had a few labels at the time, Sony, sort of sub-labels, you know, Creation uh, and uh, Rhythm King. So, yeah, we, so we didn't really deal with uh, Sony music that much in, in the beginning. It was when the third album uh, came that that's when we kind of went straight on to Sony. Yeah. Do they support you in terms of your like artistic integrity, if you like? You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that that, that that were okay actually. That they that, that were okay in the beginning, I thought. Um we signed with a guy called Rob Stringer and he was head of uh, Sony at the time. He's, I think he's head of Sony in the US now. Um or the world, you know. Mm. But uh, he was very keen, he signed uh, he had Mannix as well. 
so he was very loyal to, to the bands that he signed and gave us a lower leeway to, to get on with things. And uh, it was really good, actually. It was just kind of when we did Lustra uh, around 1997, because um, it was so kind of linked with the whole Britpop thing. And when that kind of went down the pan, you know, it was really difficult for us to just get radio play or anything. And we kind of noticed a drastic difference when we toured the album compared to previous tours, you know. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it was quite, it's quite weird, really, but... Yeah. Do you think it was just a case of people were moving away from a certain type of sounding band, or what do you think? Yeah. I, well, I, I, to, I, I kind of noticed when when we toured our third album, Lustra. This was around '98, perhaps. Um, the tours weren't as uh, well attended, and uh, you just noticed that there a lot of people, especially students, that were into kind of American bands, kind of post grunge that like blink 182 whatever they're called things like that and i thought anything to do with brick pop no one wanted to know about it really yeah at the time you know it, it was kind of dead in the water so, so to speak you know so so it, it, it was a difficult time and did you find yourself then thinking about other ways that you could you could evolve or is it what did you well not really you know we kind of we were a bit in limbo after uh, when we left Sony after the third album. Uh, we thought we wasn't sure what to do. So me, Andy and Sonia were the only people left in the band. So so this was uh, end of 1999. Uh, we decided to to go to Nepal, uh, go to Everest Space Camp for New Year's, Millennium New Year's. So me, Sonia and Andy went to bought a lot of trekking clothes, uh, had a practice trek in Richmond Park, <laughs> went to the pub straight away, um, <laughs> nothing really. Then we flew up to, uh, flew to Kathmandu and went up uh, in the Himalayas and spent three weeks walking in the mountains. Oh, wow. And uh, when we came back, uh, kind of rejuvenated. I felt um, high altitude does that to you, you know, you get lots of energy when you come back to the sea level again. Yeah. And uh, that's when we decided, okay, right, let's, let's, let's do another album completely free of any label or anything like that. So, so, I think Sonia re- remortgaged her flat at the time, uh, paid for the first album. People are expensive. And, uh, it was a great joy to, to do, to be honest with you, because there, there was no pressure from, from anybody. We had no expectations on us at all. Um, so, so we just had fun with it. And it, it was a really creative uh, process, that album. Um, we worked with a producer called Ben Hillier, um, who was is very creative guy. He just takes things and it just fucks it up, you know, yeah. uh, in a very musical way. Uh, so, so that was a really joyous kind of few weeks, you know, recording that album. So the the calm to Z- the calm of zero um, yeah. band that you formed was that was that something that came after that and uh, evolving out over your kind of musical career? Yeah, yeah, we. we, we Ballet, we just uh, after the after the last album we did together, me Andy and Sonia, uh, it was Gravity Pulse, two thousand and four, and after the album we, we basically called it a day. Uh, so you know we had um, maybe a year went by, and then me and Sonia, because I've been playing a lot of acoustic at the time, so so we decided to do something different. Let's just do some acoustic stuff and um, call it something else. You know, so it was just the two of us. How did the writing evolve from that? Was it the same, or is it? Did you find yourself settling into those roles quite easily? Yeah, quite easily. I mean, I've, I've been listening to a lot at the time. I've probably been listening to a lot of uh, folk stuff, a lot of um, uh, Americana, that kind of thing. So uh, that's what kind of came out uh, at the time. That's every time I picked up a uh, guitar and started writing songs, it was those kind of songs, you know, uh, that came out and and. and uh, we decided to do a couple of mini mini albums with just just acoustic stuff, just me and Sonia together. So uh, we might do that again. You never know. I guess now with the kind of resurgence and popularity in 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 what was a a, a popular decade, and you're seeing a lot of yeah. shine on um, gigs and uh, yeah. and lots of bands reforming and touring <laughs> again. Have you got plans yeah. to do this? I, I know that you you you've been playing well. You're playing up right right up until sort of 2020 and obviously with the pandemic everything things have obviously ground to a halt but yeah what are your future plans in terms of getting back on the road 
Well, we were supposed to do festivals this year, uh, but they were being uh, moved to next year. Yeah. Uh, we were supposed to do a few European things uh, as well. But we might do a tour towards the end of the year. It depends on uh, how we go and how the recording of the new album is going and so on, uh, if we have time. But uh, we're looking at doing some more touring uh, at the end of this year, definitely. If there are any venues to play in. <laughs> if there are any venues to play in, exactly. And if you're allowed in with uh, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. Masks and all that rubbish. When you when you look back at uh, that era, uh, mm. that time, I mean, what what are your kind of instant feelings about it? I mean, obviously, obviously you made a massive, like a, a decent career and a decent dent in terms of uh, the bands that were around and not, um, bands that were influential as well in other and bringing up other musicians. Is it tinged with any kind of regret or are you just happy to have experienced it? Uh, you, you always have regrets about certain things, but to, it was a great time. It really was uh, to be in a band uh, uh, from kind of mid nineties onwards. It really was. Uh, there was there was so many good bands about uh, record labels uh, spent a lot of money on on their acts and so on. And uh, it was just in the air. It wasn't just music. It was uh, films. It was it was uh, it was art. It was you know uh, across the spectrum. It was just a very vibrant time. You know. Yeah. And uh, but the thing is, whilst you're in it, you, you don't really see it. You, you don't really, you're not really aware of it. You just go over the flow, so to speak. And and uh, yes, you have a lot of regrets, especially with. I mean, I, I remember meeting so many people that I've should really been pleased to meet, you know. Uh, but at the time, you 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 were just so full of yourself, and because you were kind of on the up, and you know, and. Nothing kind of faced you, you know, even David Bowie, so David Bowie, so what, you know, it, it was almost like that. And, and some things I regret bitterly like <laughs> to, yeah. to this day, you know, people I, I should have, you know, spoken to perhaps or spoken to more or whatever, but never did because you just, you just were on a roll, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I look forward to hopefully very soon getting to hear the new material, Glenn. And, uh, Me too. <laughs> and, and hopefully, if you ever come down to Southampton, I'll be there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, we certainly will do Southampton at some point, definitely. You know, it's always been a good place for us, Southampton. You know. Okay, that would be fantastic yeah, to see. But thanks, uh, thanks so much for speaking to me, Glenn. I've really appreciated it. It was a pleasure. No problem at all. Thanks again to Glenn for joining me on the podcast. Uh, we've been trying to get together for nearly a year now and uh, Echo Billy have been a band that I've always wanted to feature uh, in an episode so it was fantastic. So as I've mentioned previously uh, there's loads of ways you can support the podcast. On social media you can just search for Back to Britpop on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and if you've got time and it's not too much bother pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and if you've got time a review because that really helps as well. And then finally, if you want to say thanks and buy me a virtual coffee, you can do that. Just uh, hit the Ko-Fi page link in the show notes there, and it's £3, and, and that really helps as well. So as I mentioned on the previous episode, I'm trying to get more guests together uh, to sort of get this season a bit longer. Still working on that. I don't know if there's another episode next week. I'm doing my best. But if you just follow on social media, you should be able to see any updates that I have in terms of that. Thanks for all your support so far. As you know, it is greatly appreciated. See you on the next episode.